In this tutorial, we'll begin taking a more in-depth look at the audio cue in QLab. The audio cue is used to insert mono, stereo, or multi-channel audio files into your cue list. Triggering and layering multiple audio files at any point in time is one of QLab's core functions and the key to making it such an effective tool for live performance. Using the audio cue in conjunction with the fade and group cues typically takes care of about 95% of what I need to accomplish in QLab for most productions. So getting a good handle on how the audio, fade, and group cues work together will go a long way toward helping you use QLab effectively. The fade and group cues will be discussed in tutorials 2.3 and 2.4. One note to keep in mind as you work through this tutorial, you might not be able to see all the channels in your QLab tutorial file that I'm working with when filming this video. This is because you may not have eight output channels available on your audio output device. And although you can access the features of the full Pro Bundle license within the tutorial workspace, the free version of QLab is limited to stereo output. All of the basic signal flow concepts discussed in this tutorial apply to QLab's free version as well. But there are some examples which refer to capabilities that are only possible with the Pro Audio license. I'm using the Pro Bundle license while creating these tutorials in order to provide a fairly comprehensive look at what QLab can do. So don't be too worried if your QLab channels or outputs don't look exactly like this video. If you're curious, the QLab website contains detailed information about the capabilities of each license. Q2101 is an example of a basic audio cue that might be used as a sound effect in a show. Go on Q2101 and you'll hear a very short whistle. There are a number of parameters for the audio cue that we'll be discussing. But the most fundamental parameter is the audio cue's target. Every functional audio cue plays back a specific audio file, and that file is referred to as the audio cue's target. The target file is what will be heard when the audio cue is triggered in QLab. In the case of Q2101, the target file is called whistle.mp3. Assigning and reassigning targets to audio cues was discussed in tutorial video 1.5, so please refer to that video if you have any questions. The Refresh Files button on the toolbar is available if you want to confirm that all the cues are pointing to their correct target files. It won't usually be necessary to use the Refresh Files button, but it's handy to keep in mind. Now let's spend some time talking about a very important concept in any audio system, signal flow. Because QLab is a software program, there is no actual signal flowing through QLab. However, it's easier to understand the concept of what's going on if we frame it within the context of signal flow. Once you understand the steps in QLab's signal flow, you'll be able to assign audio to specific speakers, adjust the volume levels for your cues, and deal with troubleshooting much more effectively. Here's a quick overview of the basic signal flow steps. It all starts with the audio file that's on the computer's hard drive, which is introduced into a QLab audio cue via the target setting and the input dials. Next up are the cross points matrix, level faders, and trim faders, which will be the primary locations for setting individual cue volume levels. Cue output patch, audio device assignment, and audio device output routing deal with settings related to the audio output device. And finally, there is the audio output device itself. Your sound system's signal chain likely extends beyond this point, but these are the steps directly related to QLab that we'll be addressing in this tutorial. And just in case you'd like to refer to a diagram of this signal flow, Q2102 will display the diagram, or you could access the actual image file of the diagram from the 2.1 Assets folder of this workspace. Before we dive into the details of each signal flow step, let's talk a bit about sound systems. You're likely working through this tutorial on a computer with stereo outputs. And all of the tutorial cues are designed to play back in stereo. However, we're beginning to move into topics that deal with more than two speakers. So let's create a hypothetical sound system for a live theater production to help us visualize the upcoming signal flow applications in a practical way. All of the audio examples will still be playing back in stereo, but we're going to be applying some of the ideas to a sound system with eight speakers. Stereo pairs for the main, on stage, and surround speakers, a small speaker that's built into a prop radio, and a subwoofer. It's very typical to dedicate a QLab channel to each speaker for maximum control and flexibility. So we ultimately want to send signal from QLab channels 1 through 8 to the speakers as shown in the diagram. We'll be referring to this system a number of times throughout the next few tutorials. Q2103 will display an image of this system, and once again the actual image file is available in the 2.1 Assets folder. Now let's discuss each signal flow step in detail, starting with the audio file on the computer's hard drive. Use the finder to navigate to the file crosspointloop.mp3 located in the 2.1 audio folder of the QLab tutorial assets. This stereo audio file is a short bit of music that has all the drums panned to the right channel and the other instruments panned to the left. 
If you listen to the file in the Finder's preview window, that's what you'll hear. Drums on the right, other stuff on the left. That's where this all starts, with the actual audio file on your computer. If you're having a problem with a particular cue, you may want to check the audio file to make sure that the issue is not stemming from the file itself. Moving into QLab, select Q2104 and notice that the target for Q2104 is the crosspointloop.mp3 file. The Levels tab in the inspector is where you'll be doing the vast majority of your volume adjustments, and it's divided into three sections, the inputs, the crosspoints matrix, and the faders. Let's discuss the inputs first. Drag the inspector's border so that the panel area is large enough to allow the inputs and crosspoints to be displayed below the faders. This will make it a bit easier to visualize the signal flow. The input dials allow you to specify the amount of signal that's being fed from each channel of the audio file into the crosspoints matrix by clicking and dragging on the dial indicator. As the input and crosspoints dials are opened up, the indicator turns from purple to yellow to indicate how much signal is being passed. The input dials will typically be set to full volume by default, and you can quickly toggle the dial between full on and full off by option clicking on the dial. Notice that because the target for Q2104 is a stereo audio file, there are two inputs to adjust, input 1 from the file's left channel and input 2 from the right channel. A mono audio file would only have one input dial feeding the crosspoints, while a multi-channel audio file would have more than two input dials. After passing through the input dials, the signal then travels into the row of crosspoints directly to the right of each input dial. The entire collection of dials to the right of the inputs is called the crosspoints matrix, and it provides a great deal of flexibility for routing signals from the Q's inputs to the QLab channels. Signal from the inputs is present at each crosspoint dial in the inputs row and can therefore be routed to any QLab channel. For example, in Q2104, signal from input 1, which is the left portion of the stereo audio file, has been routed to channel 1, which is assigned to the left output of the audio device and signal from input 2 has been routed to channel 2. This will maintain the left and right image of the stereo file. Play Q2104 and you should hear that the drums are panned all the way to the right and the other instruments are panned to the left, just like the target audio file. Q2104 is set up to infinitely loop, so you'll need to hit the escape key to stop the cue. Now play Q2105 and you should hear that the stereo image has completely flipped. The drums are on the left and the other instruments are on the right. Q2105 is using the exact same target file. However, if you take a look at the crosspoints matrix for Q2105, you'll notice that channel 1 is now being fed signal from input 2, and channel 2's signal is coming from input 1. This is just a quick demonstration of how the crosspoints can be used to route audio file channels to specific locations. Feel free to play around with the crosspoint dials to get different mixtures of signals to the channels. The crosspoints matrix settings are often the same for all the cues in a cue list, since you typically want to maintain the same basic inputs to QLab channels and their associated speakers. Q2106 demonstrates a very typical crosspoint setup for a show that uses our hypothetical 8-channel sound system. Notice that the crosspoints are routing the left channel of the audio file to the left speakers in each stereo pair, and the right channel of the audio file to the right speakers. Also notice that the radio prop and subwoofer, QLab channels 7 and 8, are being fed equal amounts of signal from both the left and right channels of the audio file. This is because we want those speakers to play both channels of stereo files. I've backed down the crosspoint dials an equal amount on QLab channels 7 and 8 so that we don't run the risk of overloading the QLab channel with signal from both input channels. Since most of the cues in a show will often use the same setup for the crosspoints matrix, you can set up a default for new audio cues. Open the Workspace Preferences window and select Audio from the column on the left to view the audio preferences. In the section labeled Default Levels for New Cues, you can specify default settings for the input dials, crosspoint dials, and level faders. Then, when you add a new audio cue to the workspace, the crosspoints matrix will be automatically configured for the system needs. This can save a lot of time and busy work when you're building a cue list with many audio cues. Now let's discuss the level faders, which are conveniently located in the Levels tab of the inspector, just above the crosspoints matrix. The level faders are the primary location for setting an audio cue's signal level feed for each channel, and it basically translates into the initial volume setting for the cue. The faders are pretty self-explanatory. Just click and drag the fader to raise or lower the signal level for that particular channel of the cue. Notice that these faders are modeled after analog faders, in which the unity gain position, or 0 dB, is somewhere around 90% of the fader full-up position. 
Gain structuring is a somewhat complex topic for another tutorial, but I'll quickly say that I usually set my gain structure so that a well-recorded music cue playing back with the level faders set to unity gain will provide a fair amount of volume in the room, almost too loud. I don't want to have to push too many cue levels above the unity gain position unless I really need some extra oomph, and in most cases, a lot of my cue levels typically end up well below unity in order to successfully blend with the live performance. Also note that there is a master level fader in addition to the individual channel faders. This master fader functions just as you might anticipate. It affects the overall signal level of all the cues channels. Option clicking on a fader is a quick way to toggle the fader position between the negative infinity and unity gain positions. Go on Q2107 and then reselect the cue to adjust the level faders in real time as you're listening to the cue. Notice that there's a signal level meter built into the fader that displays the signal level post fader, which means that as you adjust the fader, you'll see the changes reflected in the meter's display. Before we discuss the trim faders, we need to talk a bit more about levels in QLab and how the volume of a cue can be changed over time within the cue list. An upcoming tutorial will be dealing with the fade cue in detail, but for now it's important to know that fade cues also have level faders that are used to change the initial level settings of an audio cue. The level faders of the fade cue specify new levels for the audio cues channels, thus allowing volume changes to be programmed into a cue list. The trim faders of an audio cue can be thought of as an overall relative volume adjustment of the audio cue's initial volume level and any changes made to that volume level by subsequent fade cues. The trim faders basically allow you to quickly add some manual tweaks to this overall volume. Let's use cues 2108 and 2109 to demonstrate this concept. Q2108 consists of an audio cue that plays a short mono audio file and then two fade cues that automatically fade down the music in the middle and then fade it back up for the ending. Since it's a mono file that's playing equally in both speakers, the music should be coming from the center of the stereo image. Notice that the trim faders for the audio cue in 2108 are all set to zero, which means that they're simply letting the cue's level settings pass through with no adjustment. Q2109 is exactly the same as Q2108, except that the audio cue's trim fader for channel 2 has been lowered by 8 dB. Now the stereo image should lean a bit to the left and should maintain that same image even throughout the fade curves. This same effect could have been accomplished by lowering the channel 2 level faders of the audio cue and the two fade cues, but the trim fader offers an opportunity to make quick adjustments on the fly. The Cue Output patch is found in the Settings tab and allows you to assign each cue to a specific audio device. However, I need to clarify that statement when we discuss audio device assignment because technically audio cues are not actually assigned to specific audio devices. More on that in a moment. While complicated systems may require multiple audio devices in order to greatly increase the signal routing flexibility, most systems only require one audio device and audio cues will default to that output patch. So this is a parameter that you won't have to look at much unless you're running a large system or trying to troubleshoot a problem. And speaking of problems, Q2110 doesn't have its cue output patch set correctly. So notice that there's a red X next to the cue to warn you that there's something wrong. Also notice that when you go on an audio cue that is not patched to a functional output, the cue will not even start playback of the target audio file. Therefore, the Q output patch must be set to a functional output prior to starting the Q. A functional output patch is one that has been assigned to an audio device, which we'll discuss momentarily. Go ahead and change the Q output patch setting on Q2110 so that the Q plays its target file. Now we move from Q-specific parameters into more global settings. So we'll need to open up the Audio Preferences window again. The Audio Device Assignment section is where the eight output patches are globally assigned to the audio device or devices used by your system. And here's where we need to go back and clarify the concept of the output patch. The output patch is actually a layer of abstraction between the audio cue and the audio device. You assign an audio cue to an output patch and then assign that output patch to an audio device. This allows you to easily transfer the workspace between different systems with different audio devices and specify the new audio hardware for all the cues with one simple connection in QLab. In this case, I have a Motu 896 HD audio interface hooked up to my home system. So I simply click and drag a connection between patch 1 and my interface to work on QLab at home. When I need to transfer the workspace over to a computer in a theater, all of my audio cues will appear with red X's because the audio device setup has likely changed and disconnected the audio device assignment patch. 
To fix this, I simply call up the audio preferences and assign patch 1 to the theater's audio device, and all of my cues are functional and routed to the new hardware. The final step of the QLab signal flow is the audio device output routing. You can access this window using either the edit device button in the audio preferences window or the edit device routing button on any audio cues levels tab. You'll see a window that looks very similar to the input cross points matrix and it functions in much the same way. However, the cross point dials now represent how much signal is being fed from the QLab channel faders into the actual outputs of the audio device. Typically this is set up in a one-to-one -one configuration so that QLab channel 1 is sent to the device's first output, QLab channel 2 to the second output, and so on for all of the device's outputs. In this case, there are 14 analog outputs available on my audio device. After this point in the QLab signal flow, the signal is fed to your sound system via the audio device's analog or digital outputs. Use Q2112 to review the entire signal flow chain by adjusting some of the parameters we've discussed until you can hear a drum loop in the left speaker and an annoying dog in the right speaker. Before we wrap up this tutorial, let's take a quick look at the use of multi-channel audio files in QLab. I typically use mono and stereo files in my designs, but QLab is capable of playing back multi-channel audio files, which can be very useful. You can create multi-channel mixes in the studio that can quickly transfer to QLab for playback in a theater. It's also a great way to synchronize a number of individual elements in one file that can then be mixed in the theater space as desired. Q2113 provides an example of this with a short loop that was mixed into a surround wave file with each individual part assigned to one of the audio file's six channels. Notice that in the input section of Q2113 there are now six input dials which control the feed of the audio file channels into the cross points matrix. Experiment with the input and cross point dials to create your own mix of the loop. I'd recommend spending a bit of time exploring each step in QLab's signal flow so that you can be creative and confident when building your cue lists and troubleshooting problems.